And we're back live in Viewpoint here, High on the Hill, WLCN, Lincoln Country, Crazy Road. Um, our guest this morning is Jennifer uh, De Pasquale. Uh, we're talking once again about uh, health matters. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time, Jennifer. I mean, we know your schedule is uh, pretty tight, and we thank you very much for this. Uh, we were talking uh, while we were off the air uh, about uh, one of the things that would help children as far as uh, uh, health is concerned, not alone just diabetes, is get them out of the house, get them away from the TV set and, and their uh, little games that they run with their little thumbs and so forth. Uh, get them outside and play. Uh, that, and really, that's a very serious uh, problem countrywide. These youngsters, as Jim says, uh, they don't get to watch TV until 7 o'clock. Uh, and then maybe that for only a short time, particularly with the programs that are on for these kids. Oh, man. We'll but uh, uh, it, it, it's a responsibility of parents uh, in a great measure to get these young little beggars out on the street and get them playing. Don't turn them on the loose on the street, but get them right. out and have some activities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Play on the yellow line. Um, you, you also mentioned something about our shapes. And some people have an hourglass figure and some people are kind of pear-shaped. We're all different. Some are more different than others. <laughs> That'd be me. And that that can be a contributing factor. Right. Um, abdominal fat uh, can be, well, we've known for years that, that a hip-to-waist ratio has an effect on your heart health risk or cardiac risk. Um, if you're more apple-shaped, you're at higher risk for heart disease. If you're more pear-shaped, you're at less risk because of where you store your fat at. So if you store a lot in your abdominal area or your stomach, that's also a place where the type of fat um, that we have can make it more difficult for us to use our own insulin, that abdominal fat. I don't understand that at all. Because it produ it produ it's, uh, if you have enough, of, well we all have a, it's called a momentum. It's a layer of visceral fat between our, our organs. And if you have a lot there, um, it can cause problems because that layer of fat that momentum can actually pr it produces its own hormones insulin is a hormone also okay so it's a, so there are even some thin people who have too much um, momentum abdominal fat Interesting. that's why they're doing a lot of studies on brown fat have you heard about that no. the good fat is brown fat it actually helps to um, keep you lean it's a certain type of fat that helps keep you lean. They're doing studies on that right now. And from from whence does it, does it cometh? <laughs> it cometh from birtheth, I oh. believe, <laughs> in, in genetics. Uh, that's why they're uh, yeah they're looking at in children and seeing the benefits of that brown fat and trying to extrapolate it to adults to see how can we cultivate in adults more of this brown fat because it's protective of our health instead of destructive. Would that be uh, related to your diet at all? Do you do you know? Have I they... think that that is an inter. It, it could be, but I don't, I don't know enough about it, and I don't think that uh, so, science knows enough about it at this point to make yeah. a conclusion. They just know that people who have more of that healthy brown fat are associated with being healthier, healthier are less likely to put on weight, even when they eat the same amount of calories as other people who do not have as much brown fat. You know, Judith, so you protect me. A few more semesters, we might be referring to her as Dr. Peepus. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Oh, no. No desire to go back to school. Thank you. But <laughs> now, is that well, no, seriously, I, 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 you know, halfway facetious there, but obviously. But uh, the depth of your knowledge of, uh, of your profession uh, certainly shows through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, some people start on the pill. Does it? Is it inevitable that they end up having to take... The, the, their insulin by injection or not? Um, if you need insulin, you have to have it through injection, right? They, um, you know, the inhaled insulin didn't work out so great. Um, they're looking at patches, hormonal type patches, yes. like you can have pain patches that you put on your arm and stuff. Okay. They're looking at that um, as a possible pathway to avoid mm -hmm. injections mm -hmm. but at this point the the only way to safely get the insulin um, to where it needs to go it's got to go through the GI tract and then the stomach acid breaks it down uh -huh. so they haven't figured out a way to coat it in a pill to protect it to get it to where it needs to go 
So for right now, it's injections for insulin. You know, I'm asking folks that have to have daily injections. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, your, your little poor little body becomes a pincushion. You have to move around. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. Uh, yes. That, that seems to be, a, to me, that's a real problem sticking myself every day. It, it, it can be very um, stressful, you that's know, mentally think. and physically. Uh huh. Um, for, for a lot of people, especially children or people who are diagnosed with needing insulin earlier in life, they will have a, a pump. Mm -hmm. An insulin Hyper pump, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which will just have one port, uh, which it attaches, and you have to move that portal about every three days, or um, and it will deliver the insulin to you from from that from this little box that contains the vials of insulin in it, and that can be very helpful for children who would have otherwise needed multiple injections throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Some people do need a couple, three, don't they? Um, yes, there are um, people who need um, the basal or background insulin, which is for doesn't have anything to do with the food that you eat, just keeping your blood sugar normal without eating, and then multiple injections of a different kind of insulin that acts fast for the food that you do eat. So there are a lot of people who um, need four shots a day, some people who need up to seven or eight. And what is the deal? I can remember uh, next door to my folks' cabin, there was the loveliest family. They had 13 kids. Ooh. Yep. And um, a couple of them were diabetic. And, uh, you know, when you're on vacation, your hours sometimes <laughs> aren't exemplary. And my kids thought that they were really weird over there because mm -hmm. they had their meals at special times, you know, and we might have supper at 9, they ate right at 6, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very important to them as a family to have a real rigid schedule for meals. And how, uh, how does that fit in to the diabetes picture? It's very, very important to eat on a schedule. It doesn't mean you have to have a full meal at lunch every day. Just a, a balance of nutrition to give your body the energy that it needs until you eat again. Um, and the reason that it's important to have those scheduled meals and, or snacks if you need them is because if you choose a meal plan which is consistent in carbohydrate, okay, carbohydrate is the thing that our body turns uh, all of it into blood sugar. If you have the same amount of carbohydrate at meals on a schedule, then it's going to promote a stable blood sugar. Okay, um, That's why there's a lot of people who don't need to be on a strict eating regimen, but if they eat about the same amount of carbohydrate at each meal and have it on a schedule, that in itself will promote much better blood sugar. Hmm. Uh, but when you go skipping a meal and your body doesn't do a really good job of controlling your blood sugar by itself, mm -hmm. it does not help. Um, a lot of people who come to see me who have been diagnosed or had a new diagnosis of diabetes, they're meal skippers. Well, if your body doesn't do a good job of keeping your blood sugar stable, then you want to do everything that you can to help it be stable by eating consistently, giving it the energy that it needs. Because once you take those meals away and start skipping, your body has to go make its own energy. Okay? and. What happens then is if you don't give your body the energy it needs and it uses up all the stuff in your bloodstream, um, and what it does is it goes and it makes its own glucose or blood sugar. It takes glycogen, which means stored, stored glucose, okay? Takes that out of your muscles and then it goes down to your liver. Your body will make its own glucose or blood sugar, release that in the bloodstream. We don't want our body to do that on a regular basis. Okay, we were programmed to be that way because we used to have to go through periods of famine, right? But that's not how it is anymore. And our bodies are kind of losing the genetic ability to regulate our blood sugar well when we go uh, skipping meals and going long periods without eating. Now, hypoglycemia, is, mm -hmm. is that the very opposite of diabetes or how does that happen? Well, hypoglycemia is when the blood sugar tends to get too low instead of with diabetes where the blood sugar uh, gets too high. Um, 
you can look at hypoglycemia as the opposite side of, of the diabetes coin, okay? Although they do share some simil similar characteristics. When your blood sugar gets too low, it's because you're producing too much insulin, okay? Um, like in response to a meal, someone who does not have a blood sugar problem would make enough in, or would make enough insulin, release it to get the blood sugar down to the normal level, no matter what you ate. Mm -hmm. okay? It could be a bag of candy and a bottle of sugar pop. Without blood sugar problems, your body's going to produce enough insulin to get that blood sugar normal. If you have diabetes, what happens is you might be producing too much insulin, but your body doesn't use it well enough. It's insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. It can't get the blood sugar down to a normal level, or it's not producing any at all, and you got to have a shot of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, with hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, um, your body doesn't know when to turn off. That it, It's like it's producing too much insulin, kind of like it's squirting out like a fire hose, and the blood sugar goes down too much. Okay, So for people who have low blood sugar problems, guess what the dietary treatment is? It's the same as if you have diabetes. Consistent carbohydrate, eat your meals on a schedule, have a balance of carbohydrates and protein and fat at your meal to keep your blood sugar from going too high or too low and avoiding uh, simple sugars by themselves because that can make you have rebound low blood sugar after it gets used up. It's you know, the same Lisa, treatment. Uh, Lisa, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lady down south, Lisa Pasquese, and this is Deepa Squally. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, um, what took place in this gentleman's body? Um, I was at a business dinner a long time ago, and suddenly everything was fine. And the next thing you know, he's got slack jawed and his, uh, his speech is slurred. And if you didn't know better, you'd, you'd think it was inebriation. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely not the case because there was nothing available. Uh, what takes place in the person's body when, the, when those, uh, system, uh, those symptoms manifest themselves? Well, um, <clears throat> When you start seeing, and, and it could happen either way, super low blood sugar or super high blood sugar, depending on what an individual's, pro individual's problem is. But if we uh, use an example of someone whose blood sugar got so high, okay, um, your blood sugar gets really high and the body tries to compensate, okay? Body wants to get that blood sugar within normal level. So it starts producing or excreting as much insulin as it can to try and get that blood sugar down. But let's say you don't use your insulin well. So then your body, the liver starts making its own glucose because all it, your body, even though your blood sugar is really high, all your body knows is I'm hungry, I'm not being fed. I need glucose. Mm -hmm. So your body produces more. The blood sugar gets even higher. Um, for people who do not have um, insulin dependent or type 1 diabetes, they call it a hyperosmolar. <laughs> so you ready? ready? Commit that to memory, Bill. Yeah, Hyper <laughs> pop quiz on that. H-H-N-K-S. -H what it means is, is that your body starts taking all the water out of the rest of your areas to try and put it in your bloodstream and decrease your blood glucose level. Kind of like to dilute it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what happens to that, it, when that happens, is you get dehydrated, your body gets dehydrated. Um, when you get dehydrated, you get confused. Um, you can lose consciousness. Uh, for, so that's people, a way that people who don't have uh, insulin deficiency can get like that. Then for people who do have insulin deficiency, um, usually when their blood sugar gets really low, um, they start to get confused, shaky, sweaty. Um, act like they're inebriated, like you said, mm -hmm. and it's be and when one of these things happen, it's because the organs aren't getting any energy. The blood sugar could be super high or super low, but those organs aren't getting any energy, so you start acting confused. Can you imagine? Um, you might start talking funny uh, if your brain wasn't getting enough oxygen. Same thing if your brain's not getting any glucose or fuel. Hmm. Okay. Why do they give a person who's having a spell? Uh, orange juice. Oh, for someone with low blood sugar, they would give them orange juice because uh, four ounces of orange juice or soda um, has about 15 grams of natural quick-acting sugar. 
or carbohydrate, simple carbohydrate. That 15 grams of sugar can be expected to increase your blood sugar from 30 to 45 points within 10 minutes. And then after about 15 minutes, it's burned up and used up already, and then the blood sugar starts going back down. So it's good to treat a low blood sugar reaction. But um, what I find is that a lot of people don't know that you don't just treat it that one time and then walk away. You have to check it after 15 minutes. Make sure your blood sugar is stabilized. And if not, you treat it again with simple sugar. Okay. And it, once your blood sugar stabilizes, then you go to have something to eat, which has um, regular carbohydrate, protein, fat, because that quick acting, that simple like for blood instance. sugar. Oh, like a peanut butter sandwich and some milk. Um, you know, a regular meal, like whatever lunch you had planned. Uh -huh. But when your blood sugar gets to be less than 70, they call that clinical hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. And we encourage people to treat that with 15 grams of simple sugar, whether it's from four ounces of orange juice or a glucose pill. Some people carry them around. But you got to check it after that 15 minutes and make sure that it's stabilized because a lot of people who suffer from low blood sugar, once it swoops down there, you're really likely to have another episode of low blood sugar within the next 48 hours. Okay. Now, this can be very serious, can't it? Very if, much. What if, what if you had one of these spells and there was nobody there to help you? Right. And, or if you had one of those spells and you didn't self-treat in time. Uh-huh. Right. Um, you could slip into a coma. Diabetic coma. Mm-hmm. Can that be fatal? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. We usually call the diabetic coma for when your blood sugar gets way too high. But this is a, the other side of that coin. Again, your blood sugar gets so low that your organs wouldn't get any energy. They would start failing. You know. Do you know we're aware of the, of the big C, uh, which is such a, 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 a terrible problem with cancer in many, many, many forms? And it occurs to me, without minimizing any of that at all, that living with di a diabetic has an insidious disease as well. Very much so. Is that fair to say? Very much. And, and what, what really frightens me as an educator is that there are so many people out there who have had diabetes for many years or who are at real risk for developing it, and they just don't have the education they need. Um, obviously, I could I could talk for hours and hours about stuff, and I do, I do mm -hmm. at the classes, and mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to come to those classes, mm -hmm. and I actually need to get a blurb in here. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, please do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because as of January first, two thousand twelve, in the state of Illinois, any insurance carrier in the state of Illinois must pay for diabetes self management education. Okay, that's Public Act. Say that again, please. <laughs> Um, as of January 1st, 2012, every insurance carrier in Illinois must pay for diabetes self-management education, the DSME classes that I offer. And they are so important. Um, you learn so much about why things happen, how to um, prevent complications, how to deal with complications and stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and planning for vacations and trips and Anything else you can think of, mm -hmm. uh, going to holiday gatherings, you know, what are some strateg strategies to use there? Plus, there are other people there who have diabetes, and you can learn from them. You can share your story, which is very important for someone who's dealing with a chronic disease, because despite the reports you hear on TV about people, I'm cured my diabetes. And that does happen for some people. doesn't mean it's gone. It just means you have no symptoms and need no medication. But for most people, this is never going to go away. It's always going to be an issue to deal with, and that can be extremely stressful because you don't get a day off from it. No. You know. Jennifer DePasquale, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge mm -hmm. with us. Uh, very, very helpful, I ho hope, to a lot of folks out there who have those problems. Uh, as I was told the other day, that uh, Mrs. Busby, that somebody uh, enjoys what, our little closing quips, whatever they may be. Uh, so to, I could uh, be that somebody. To, to <laughs> <laughs> so to, uh, to kind of conform to the subject of health this morning, uh, old Mark Twain, he always came up with a few good ones. Uh, Mark said, be careful about reading health books. You may die of a misprint. <laughs> Thank you for Viewpoint. <laughs>